So, Emangi, officially welcome yeah, to the Performance welcome. Formula podcast. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Uh, I've been seen or spoken to in a long time, so it was uh, great to have you the other day. Uh, yeah, so yeah, really excited and uh, looking forward to the podcast. Cool, man. Um, Mangi, I'm not too sure if everybody knows you. Um, m- maybe by way of introduction, give us a little bit of where you're from originally and a little bit of your cricket journey just so that people can sort of get a sense of who we've got with us here today. Yeah. Uh, so my cricket journey might take a bit long because I played for a couple of teams. Um, but uh, so, yeah, my name is Magali Somosethe. I come from um, a little town called Duduza in the East Rand. Uh, so that is like about 30 minutes from Pinani. Uh, yeah, I grew up playing most of my cricket there. Played for Easterns, Titans, Lions, uh, Better the Dolphins, the Knights. And uh, I finished off my uh, playing career at Easterns again. Um, so yeah, not uh, yeah, not much to say about that. But uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty much uh, my story there. Mm. Yeah, I mean, so so people might not know this, but you you also you, you didn't mention it there, but you played for South Africa as well. Yeah, <laughs> couple of uh, yeah, couple of, yeah, a couple of T Twenty games, if I'm correct. Yeah, a couple of T Twenty games. So I've got seven caps. Uh, obviously, I spent. Uh, most of my young career playing SA Imaging, being at the academy, playing SAA. And um, yeah, I was fortunate to play a couple of games for the Proteus, um, which has always been a, a dream of mine. I would have loved it to be Test Cricket ideally, uh, but I think if you play for your country, then it's a massive honor. Yeah. So that, that journey, right, could not have been easy. I mean, coming from a small rural township, I don't know. I've never been in Duduza. I'm assuming it's a little bit more rural, right? I might, I might have that, I might have that wrong, and happily correct me. But I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's a little bit more rural. It's not a big city or anything like that. Growing up in that environment to getting to play for the Proteas, what would you say was the most significant things on your journey that made a difference for you to get there, or to even just become um, a professional? Yeah, I think, I mean, when I chat to, um, obviously as I've grown older and kind of getting to understand myself a bit more, uh, I've gotten to chat a lot with like a lot of the youngsters in the team. And a common question is that like, I mean, how are you so resilient? You know, like you failed and you face like a lot of obstacles. And I think uh, coming from a small town like that also has to do with that, you know, because... Uh, I look at most of my success as a cricketer or as a human being is that uh, I face a lot of obstacles, you know, and uh, when you come uh, from a small town, I never went to, uh, I went to a good school, but it wasn't like a, a prestigious school. Um, so you, you learn a lot of resilience, you know, and um, that's something that I've always had. I never thought I did. And I think uh, my biggest, um, um, I wouldn't say achievement is that, like, I remember back in the day, I met Ray Jennings uh, at uh, a tap camp, that's what they call them these days, and uh, he said one day he'll play for South Africa, and I held that um, in my heart and my mind from the age of 11 uh, up until I did, you know. So I had someone that um, saw something I never saw in myself, you know, because uh, coming from a small town, we always believe it's only guys that goes to good schools or guys that come from big cities that make it, but... You know, for me to walk through that journey, uh, I would have loved to play more games for the protest, but for me to have the opportunity to do that, I'm very grateful for that. Mm, yeah. Okay. Um, and so your primary skill sets, right? And, and, and this is really what I want to delve in maybe a little bit more along with your journey was to bat and to keep wickets. And I don't think I've ever had anybody on the podcast yet to talk about wicket keeping. So um, I'm. I'm pretty excited about that you know a, a lot of the time cricketers get taught that they have to field well they have to bat well they have to potentially be able to bowl and then you get a skill you know like wicket keeping that's often neglected it's not the it's it's not in every practice necessarily you know we do fielding and then the wicket keeper sometimes runs with and <laughs> fields, yeah. fields with the rest you know or if it's a net, basically you're practicing batting and bowling, but the wicket keeper doesn't always get to do their primary skill or one of their core skills, essentially, that's important for the team. So if you think of like those early stages of developing your game, 
how, how, did, how did you develop your wicket keeping? You know, like what are some of the things that you did that met to make sure that those skills also stay sharp? Or maybe it's stuff that coaches. Um, I, I think, I mean, I remember the first time I ever fell in love with cricket, I was watching Jack Callis, so I always wanted to be like him. Um, and, you know, like going through my young career, um, I remember both eight wides in the game. And I think I was actually very fortunate that our coach at the time was a wicket keeper. And at the time at junior school, you don't really have like a set wicket keeper. We used to take turns. Um, and we played a six aside, day, six aside game. And uh, I kept a right that game. And at the time I was captain, but I wasn't allowed to bowl because I bowled so many wides there. Yeah. But I played it on the ball that swung a bit too much. It wasn't me. The ball just swung a bit too much. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I mean, I, I was very fortunate that I had a, a guy from Easterns, um, uh, Mr. Solid Church and Rusty Twala, which was a role model of mine growing up as wicket keeper. And, um, you know, what he did with me at the time was that we practiced keeping every day, you know, so for, for him, uh, fielding practice wasn't me just standing next to the stumps and catching the balls from the fielders. We had specific time for wicket keeping, you know, so we were at the hostel at the time. So I knew I needed to be there 20 minutes early to work on my keeping, you know, so he drilled me and it was a bit tough, you know. Um, but as I said, in terms of like resilience, he taught me like a lot of things in that because we'll get in a situation where in a game, uh, cause we had, um, coaches as empires and he will walk walk into the game with a helmet on and if he felt the wicket wasn't bouncing as much he'll give my helmet and say you have to stand up you know so that's where I sort of like led my trade but I think uh, one thing about wiki keeping is uh, you know it seems like a very boring job uh, but I think it's the most exciting and that's also my biased opinion um, because there's a lot of things you can do as a wicket keeper and one thing that I've learned throughout my career is that if you do not love wiki keeping you can never be a better wiki keeper you know and uh, when it comes to like coaching, I've been fortunate to to be around people that spoke the same language, that shared the same passion throughout my whole career. And um, I think maybe a lot of the coaches don't have the confidence to chat about keeping or to coach it. But uh, I was fortunate that I had people that were really keepers that walked through along my journey. Mm. Well, what is the most fun thing about wicket keeping? Um, I know it's going to sound a bit odd, and uh, I believe leg spinners and wicket keepers we're very strange people. Uh, but I loved keeping on day four on a wicket where it was rough. For me, I found that it's like theater. I found that it's like excitement, you know. So I love keeping on wickets where the wicket was like staying low. Maybe in East London, a PE on day four where the wicket is inconsistent, where I could come up to the wickets and show my skill. Um, you know, I love like having a bit of banter with the batter, you know. Um, and um, I think for me, I always wanted the opportunity on day four to get up to the stumps or to take a brilliant catch to change the game. You know, so that was always my mindset and how I saw we did keep it. Okay, so what I'm hearing is you like the, so there's a lot of resilience in your story so far and picking the toughest moment to keep wicket, getting the most joy out of that. Um, how, how does that sort of, uh, and maybe this is a question supposedly for later, right? But it's in my head at this point in time. How does how does the lessons you've learned from wicket keeping to be resilient and to sort of choose to enjoy the toughest moments where the wicket's maybe up and down and it's turning and it's you know doing all the nasty stuff? There's, it seems to me like there's a similarity between those two, right? There's this resilience that's been taught to you, and then you get the most joy out of almost like the more difficult type of situations. Often we hear in sport that people say that sport teaches you about life and often cricket is coined, especially in South Africa, as a sport that teaches you the life lesson. Um, how, how, how is that stuff relevant for you? Um, so, like, I mean, as, as we spoke earlier when I, when I spoke about the introduction, also it boils down, you know, just my upbringing, you know, uh, obviously coming from the township and you learn all of those things, but... Uh, I, I don't want to get you. So I look at uh, my, I was never an opening batsman growing up at school, you know, um, and Ray James was like my last year final 19, he went up in the batting. So I was like, okay, cool, I don't know where this is going. And the first time I walked in into the Titans uh, changing room, they asked me. So I looked at, okay, we've got all of these guys here. 
and the whole bunch of superstars, where can I get my opportunity and how can I make it work, you know? So when the coach asked me, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to open the batting. So I'll put myself out there knowing full well that I could potentially fail. But if I had to fail, I would fail in my own terms, you know? And I knew with myself, if I put myself in a situation where I face a bit of pressure, I was able to, like, deal with that, you know? Um, and I think that has, it ties in then what we spoke about with keeping is because I always look for the opportunity. I always look for, like, a tough stamping. I always look for uh, an opportunity when the team was about to declare, can I go up the order, you know? Uh, when we're chasing 10 and over, can I go up the order? So my approach to, like, life was always looking for an opportunity. And to track back to what you asked earlier is that we didn't have a, really a lot of opportunities growing up. So whatever opportunity was presented, I wanted to put myself in a situation, you know, to see what I would potentially do. And for some reason, if I track back in my career, is that's what made Mangi who he is. Mm. Yeah. I recall, a, and, and maybe this is a bit more of a batting story, and I know your batting had its ups and its downs, right? It wasn't necessarily something that was flowing throughout your career. And that, I'm assuming, had its own struggles. But I, I recall the innings you played for Titans. I think it was in a final. You might have gotten a 60-odd or an 80-odd. Um, I think it was a T20 competition. I don't yeah, know if you opened I the think, batting. I think, you, I, I think you might have batted lower down the order, but I, Titans might have been in a little bit of trouble. Uh, you know, and so I, I don't know if I've got all of that correct, right? That's my, my yeah. memory is a little bit vague. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, but, but, I, but yeah. as you're speaking, that sort of comes into my mind as maybe a moment where even this resilience showed up in your batting, you know, and all the work that you did there over your career, sort of a payoff at the end. Yeah, 100%. I, mean, I think you're talking about the game. We played uh, the, the Dolphins in the T20 final at Supersport Park. Uh, I think I got you know, 87 of like 30 balls or something like that. Uh, and um, a surprising story, and, and you're going to love this, is that uh, I've got a 67 on a Sunday against uh, the Warriors in PE. Um, and we already qualified for the playoffs. Um, and I remember when I, I, I left the play and I spoke to Rob, and Rob was like, hey, means I feel like you're going to do something special, you know? And uh, that whole week, in practice and everything, I was just in flow, you know. Um, so I knew I was going to do something special. What it was, I didn't know, you know. So I remember I got the 87. The game was obviously done and very the LB walked in to finish the game. I walked up the stairs. I took off my pads and I was like, what just happened here? So uh, when he spoke about like a state of flow uh, earlier on, when he spoke about uh, performance, uh, you know, for me, that was, like, so relatable. And that's why I asked the question, is that that day, everything else felt like a dream throughout the whole day. Up until I took off my pads, when I finished batting, I was like, what just happened, actually? Yeah. Uh, it was amazing. Like, I saw the ball very slow. Um, I saw the boundaries very tiny. I was in bounded that we were chasing, like, 187 then, you know. So it was just, like, an interesting um, feeling in my career then. Yeah, yeah. No, brilliant. And I think, I mean, we obviously spoke earlier in the week and we had sort of this opportunity to talk about flow and, and performance and that sort of thing. And yeah, I think often people don't find that ever in their lives. And sometimes they only find it once. And I think that was part of our conversation was to see how can we, how can we try and get into that place a little bit more often and a bit more regularly. Um, okay, cool. So, so if we talk about wicket keeping, what makes a wicket keeper in your mind? Um, so what do I, they I need? Think I, have, uh, I think I might have uh, mentioned it a bit earlier, um, is that in order to be a good wicket keeper, you're going to have to love wicket keeping. You know? uh, if you track back and you look at all um, the, the great wicket keepers like Alan Knott, uh, Chris Reed, James Forster, Ian Healy, Rod Marsh, Mark Boucher, Dave Richardson, they all have a similar trait in their character. And they're all like tough people. And uh, I think sometimes we misunderstand the word tough. You know, tough doesn't mean that we have to look grabby and be at the guy's face. You know, tough could be internal. So a good example is uh, when I play with uh, Grant Rulipson at the Dolphins. Grant is a very calm guy, very chilled. 
but here at present, you know, I'm a little bit more different um, at you and stuff like that, but we still have the same effect and still do the same job, you know. So I think, you know, when it comes to like being people also need like a, a natural ability which, which you need to be athletic. So you can coach a bit of technique, but there's characters that you need along your way that will help you. And being grubby, as, as, as uh, not proud as I am to say, it, it's just one of those traits. You know, we just like a different breed. And I know that the game has like moved on uh, these days where Adam Gilchrist has changed like the perception of wiki keeping, but I still feel there's a place for wiki keepers because um, the easiest thing for a coach is to pick a batsman that can keep and teach them keeping. But, you know, the hardest thing is to pick a wiki keeper and teach them how to bat, you know? So for me, I feel like it's an easy job. So, I mean, I had a, an interesting conversation with Adrian Beryl when I played for Power Rocks. And he was like, we picked you because we had like two spinners and we knew if Bjorn or Shema had to bowl a good year or the other one and we missed a stumping, that could be the championship. You know, so the finer details which we get keeping, I think they're very important. Yeah. And, and I love that you, I love that you bring that up because I think so often that is the case. You know, we, we need a, we need a wicket keeper. So we take somebody who can bat really well and Maybe they're a half decent fielder, I'd hope. You know, and they say, yeah, okay, cool, I'll take the gloves, pick me, I'm open, sort of thing, versus saying, you know, have we got somebody that's skilled enough to win us games at the win us games behind the stumps and then we teach them to be better batters? And that is often the more difficult thing, you know? Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, like, you know, from a batting point of view, I feel like I've got this sort of stuff figured out in my head where I know that. Um, you know, the first thing that you teach a modern batter is an ability to hit the ball, as an example, and swing their bat effectively. Like, to me, I've got that figured out. If somebody can't swing their bat at all, the likelihood of them becoming a world-class batter or just a half-decent batter or a batter that can become a professional is very small. Or I think the opportunity for that reduces. Is there things like that in wicket-keeping where you can almost say with certainty, like if a wicket-keeper, and I only use the swing of a bat, there's most probably weight transfer and a couple of other things that you can put in that batting, batting block. Is there things from a wicket-keeping point of view that would make you go, you know what, if a, bat, if a wicket-keeper can do A, B, C, then they've got a future ahead of them. If they can't do A, B, C, then in all likelihood, you know. And, and I mean, yeah. you're talking, I'm talking yeah, more from a skill point of view, right? I get the love of it and I have, to me, I completely understand that. But if I had to sort of just think about skills, what would be like the core things that if they can't do that, then they should maybe not even consider, or they've got to develop that first kind of thing. You know? uh, and I think like now, now that I'm coaching, my um, thinking is a bit more different. Uh, and I think I've obviously been fortunate enough to get involved in the tap camps for the S719 has got a tourism right now and I had to help out with the keepers, you know. So one of the questions that one of the keepers asked me is like, why does Quinton keep like that, you know? So when I thought about it and my answer was that you cannot compare yourself to Quinton because Quinton is like one of a kind, yeah. So it's like saying, can I play a reverse sweep like A.B. De Villiers? A.B. hardly ever plays a reverse sweep. It's natural instinct to him. He's got that, yeah. And some of us limited. So for me, my advice to the young keepers was that look at all the keepers that have the good basics, so which will be my posture when the ball is delivered, where do I catch the ball, and my hand positions. Because that you can teach along the way. And then a great catch happens, a great stumping has, but you cannot take a great stumping if you don't have the fundamentals. So it's the same with the, the argument, not the argument, but the conversation with Eddie is that we have a lot of keepers that takes, a lot of keepers that can bet that takes a brilliant stumping and misses like half a chance, you know? They don't have the right fundamentals for them to be good during that stage, you know? So for me, is if I'm coaching a keeper, I always look at what's his ability, what he's good at, and how can I enhance his skills? but I can only enhance the skills if you've got the basic fundamentals right. So it's, where's my position when I catch the ball? Where's my head? Where's my hands? How's my feet? How's my athletic ability? Then you can work around it, you know, because that plays a massive part moving forward in your career. You know? So it's quite interesting because 
a lot of the times, uh, the guys ask me, why do you keep differently when you keep in East London at the Wanderers? So I said, I realized one thing when I was 28, which I would have learned a little bit earlier, is that I looked at all the best keepers in the world and what the conditions were. So, for an example, if I wanted to learn about feet movement and diving, I looked at Australian keepers. If I had to look at uh, the keepers that were good, up to spin uh, and turning wickets, I look at the Asian keepers. If I had to look at the keepers that were good, up to the stumps and where the ball is wobbling, I look at the Australian keepers. So I bottle my keeping all around those keepers, you know. So wicket keeping is not like a set way, you know, and uh, I like the method that Kriya said, wicket keeping is about methods. You find methods in the day. You know, so there's days where I wouldn't set up the same at the wonders as I would the previous day. But the basics remain the same. Catch the ball leg, have a good posture, lead with your head. But I will keep it a little bit more different here. Could you give an example of what would be different in that way, say, between a South African wicket and an Asian wicket, as an example? Like, what, what, what would be the things that you would be doing differently? So, so for, for an example, I think in South Africa we sit in a very fortunate position because I think we're the only country that can simulate all the conditions from different fields around the world. You know, so for an example, I knew uh, Highfield, so that will be like the Wanderers, that will be Supersport Park, maybe a bit more so Bloom, is I miss most of my stampings, you know, with the ball bouncing a bit high, you know because it's hard to the ball bounce a bit high. So the technique of wicket keeping, we been taught to stand up with the ball in the high field or stand up a little bit early to get that stumping, you know. So when we go to the coast on day three and part and stuff like that, we've been taught to, we've been taught to stand up with the ball, but they all stay for low for a little bit long because most of the stumpings that all miss, either they'll be turning past the bench or they'll be quite low, you know. So the method, is a bit different, but the technique still remains the same. So even if, even though the ball is staying a bit low, I'm still leading with my head. I'm still having a good posture. Even if the ball is bouncing a bit high, I'm still leading with the head. I'm still having a good posture. But the difference is that the technique says you must stand up with the ball, but I stand up differently in those kind of conditions. So a good example is that when I kept at the Wanderers, bowling from uh, the golf course end, when I kept to Piran, the ball wobbled a bit. You know, so the technique says catch on your right hip. When he bowled the after T, I caught in front of me because I wanted to catch in front of my eyes, you know. So those are the things. But obviously that comes with experience, you know, because obviously I, I had played for a little bit long, but I had to figure that out. So a good, a good example that I would say is that we always speak about a better needs to have a game plan, a better needs to have a game plan. A wiki keep also needs to have a game plan. It might not be as complex, but you also have to have a game plan. How am I going to keep down the slope? I can't set up the same. How am I going to keep with the slope? I can't set up the same. If it's turning, if it's not turning. Basically, similar sort of thing. If it's swinging or not swinging. If it's seeming and not yeah. seeming. All of those things will come into play. I actually love that because I've never... Personally, I'm talking about me personally as a, as a cricket coach. I, I would always say I can coach the basics of wicket keeping. You know, I can, I can coach sort of the stand, catch in front of you, get your hands out in front, catch late. But I never really thought about the idea of these variations. You know, we were taught as coaches, say, on a level one, level two course, you catch on your inside hip. Uh, Grant Morgan taught me a couple of years later, no, to younger keepers, let them catch in front of them. They don't have to because they just need to get their head in line and catch when they're like nine, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> they don't have to worry about more yeah. than that. But it's sort of interesting to hear you sort of add a different texture onto that for me personally in saying, like I would take a batter and say, okay, hit this one over my head, hit this one on the ground past my feet, hit this one softly. We're playing the same shot, but we have different execution of it. You know, it's a, it's a cover drive that we're hitting over extra cover, but one I want softly towards extra cover for a quick single, one I want through extra cover on the ground, one I want over extra cover. What you, but we're using the same fundamentals. What you're essentially saying is that there's this variety in wicket keeping or this variation. The fundamental stays in place, but you learn to adapt and adjust that. Maybe the timing of it, maybe the, 
the, the speed of the movement of it based on the conditions, based on, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the type of bowler that's bowling. I like and, that. And, and, yeah, and, and I think, like, I mean, a good conversation that I had with some of the young keepers that were in and around the under 17 camp is that I sat a lot in, like, the bowlers' meetings, you know. The reason I said that because I knew, okay, when I kept to pangs, so, and I, I, I want to say this like loosely, till this day I cannot pick Shemo, you know, and I played with him for a long time. But I knew if Shemo bowls back over land, it's a leggy. If he bowls outside of stump, it's a good lean. And if he bowls it a little bit slow outside of stump, you know, so I could set up for that, yeah. You know, but I spent time like studying his action. So when Shemo was bowling badly, I would say, Shemo, you're dropping your front arm. You know, this is what you were doing in practice, you know. So for, it might look likely, but there's a difference between um, the ball hitting your fingers and missing a stamping and the ball going in your gloves and getting a stamping. There's a difference between, you know, not moving early enough to catch the ball for going to draw who swings the ball away, which he hardly ever going to bowl. He hardly ever going to bowl. Uh, down with the leg side. So for grand pitchers, I'll set up a little bit wide, but the, 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 the technique says that I need to set up on off stump. But for him, I can set up on court stump because I'm trying to cover, you know, the outside. So then I can say to Lisa Hendricks, at first, go to one and a half. I can say to Dom Hendricks, go to two and a half, and we can have our, our guy a little bit wider. But then when we, in the enhanced side, when we go to uh, the coast where we need to bowl a little bit more straight, I can say you guys can come a little bit tight, but it took me to understand what the bowlers were trying to do in order for me to set up and keep the same technique, but have a different method for the conditions. Yeah, I, I, I'll get into that in a minute, but I, just before we sort of working with the angles and things like that, right? But just before we get there, you, you've mentioned these words like lead with your head. What, is, what does that mean? Is it only sideways? Is it forward? Like, what's the what, when you say those words? What is that? Um, so, so lead with your head is so because, uh, and I, I think I'm learning that now that I'm a coach. Sometimes with little kids, they do not perceive. So when I say lead with the head, they go forward with the head and their hands behind it. So you get your hands out in front, and then uh, when I coach the young kids, I say, imagine you've got uh, a string um, on your wrist and it's tied onto your helmet. So lead with your hands out in front and your head and your hands work together. But I have to try to catch the ball in front of my eyes because I cannot catch what I cannot see, you know? But if I'm leading with my head, same with the batting. So we speak about if you're falling over, if you're falling over, it's because your head is going onto the offside. But we want to try to get our head going towards the ball. It's the same with video keeping. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, I mean, from, a, from that point of view, it makes sense. So, you're, you're thinking lead with your head. It would predominantly be sideways movement. Predominantly. Yeah. Basically, yeah, when, you, predominantly. When, you, when, you catch, when you're catching bowlers, right? It would be sort of sideways getting into the line of the ball. Yes. That's, in, that, that, that's interesting. If you think of, say, something like a leg side take, I, I always understood that there was two techniques with that. One was to go with your head first, but then often the batter would be in the way. Versus letting your feet almost like swing out underneath your body, keeping your head slightly more offside so you can track the path of the ball for longer and then last minute get your head to go leg side. I wonder if that's, you know, like how would you coach that? Or do you also they coach sort of go with your head first, try and get your head down there as quick as you can? Uh, so, so in the same breath, uh, I believe, and um, I mean, obviously there's like different theories on batting, bowling and even keeping is that we speak in betting, see the ball early played late. Same with keeping, see the ball early catch it late. Because a lot of times, because I'm here to meet someone, I haven't yet, that is going to gauge what the bounce is going to be, because we've got a batsman in front of us, what's going to gauge what the bounce is going to be, what the pace is going to be. So it's hard to move there and get there early, because I'm always going to pound the ball. You know. So when you're moving down leg, um, we have to try and move in a swing pattern, same with like our bat swing. We have to try see the ball early, move late, but I cannot overcommit 
moving down maybe. If I overcommit and the ball stays low, I'm going to struggle. You know, so a good, a good exercise will be if I'm moving down leg, which we try always to drink every movement when you do movie keeping drills, is keep your hands low for as long as possible. And as you see the ball, you stand up with your hands. But a lot of the kids, they move early and they pause. So that's why they snatch the ball. That's why they pound the ball because there's no rhythm to have like a bit of like that give. I don't know if that makes sense, you know? So. I think see the ball early. So even if it means you have a bit of a trigger onto, uh, the, for an example, like if I'm keeping that, I have a bit of a trigger, I'm staying there, and then when I move, I want to swipe the ball. So I don't want to move the weight and then palm the ball here. I don't know if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's almost like the words that are coming to my head, and maybe it's not the best way to describe it, but it's almost like saying there's a relationship between the wicketkeeper and the ball, and, and I, you use the word rhythm, right? You use the word rhythm, but there's, it's like, it's almost like you're in love with each other. And so when the ball comes, you're not forcing anything on the ball. You're sort of watching it, moving with it, letting your hands catch the line of the ball rather than just, I'm here like a truck or something or a wall in your way and I've got to just stop you. Uh, that's sort of the image that came to my mind. I, do, I see you smiling, but I don't know if it makes any sense. <laughs> that, that's that kind I, of like the sense of me. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put you in that one, a relationship with the ball. I love it. Yeah. I'm writing it down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm loving it. Yeah. Well, it comes from you, right? It comes from you. It's yeah. not my stuff. It's when you spoke. Yeah. That's, the, yeah. that's sort of how I saw it. Like if, it's like a, maybe a, a different way. It's like you're in a dance with the ball. If you've got a, if you've got a yeah. dance partner, then it's, it's not sort of a one-sided, okay, just one person does one thing and the other doesn't the other thing. If there's a rhythm between the two, how they ebb and they flow so that there can be this beautiful harmony between the wicket keeper and the ball, which makes it more of an art, which makes it more of an art. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, I, think, uh, I think I'm going to tell my headmaster we should put wicket keeping as an art uh, subject at school, yeah. <laughs> subject at school. <laughs> yeah. no, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. So you, you spoke about this idea of the angles and the, well, you didn't speak about it so directly, but you spoke about maybe where you position yourself and then how you would speak to the rest of the field in terms of where they need to be and need to go, right? Um, and I mean, often we hear wicked keepers must play a part on setting the angles and things like that. But as a keeper, what is it that you take note of to know how people must adjust? Um, so then we, we will speak about conditions, um, and I'll, I'll get it. I'll get, and that's what I've been trying to coach the kids that I coach now is also understanding who's batting. So we speak about angles. Uh, so the angles would be if you play in the high field, quick bounce wickets, you want to be a little bit more finer because the ball is going to go a bit fine. You know, slow wickets, you want to be in front of the wickets because the guys are looking to get the ball straight. In the high field, you can use the pace. In um, the coast, you're going to have to like generate pace by being at the ball, so we're going to look at the ball a little bit more in front. You know? But I mean, to dial it a bit more deeper is that um, when a batsman walks in for me, you know, and as a keeper, that's the information I'll give to the bowler. I look at the back lift, I look at the setup. You know? So if someone is like, very upright, it means we're going to look to try the ball square, so we're looking to bowl a little bit full. So even if the condition suggests that uh, again, method and technique, even though the conditions suggest that they need to be in front, but because they are probably looking to cut and pull, we can have those guys accordingly. So if a guy's got a low back lift and he's setting up low, he's looking, you know, to be at the ball here. Yeah. You know, so I think for me, uh, that's what I've learned and that's what I've enjoyed, you know, like that, that, that uh, performance uh, uh, presentation that you've had because I take pride in to actually try and stand What's the best man thinking? You know, so I will say to Pants, if I see a better, you know, fidgety and starting to tap the bat hard, I oh, know Pants a little bit slow, a little bit wider. It's only a bit of time he comes down the wicket chair. You know, so if I see somebody walking in with a low body language, I'll say to Bjorn, I take the stumps because we're gonna get him out. He's very vulnerable there. You know, so those are the things that a really keeper does. So really keeper is just not standing behind the stumps. You know, it's actually also understanding, you know, and through like emotional intelligence and psychology, what's the better trying to do it, where we can find him out, you know? And it doesn't have to be like taking your extra cover 
holding it by five meters. It could be by like half a meter. That might be the difference, you know. It could be he's got a low back lift, he's looking to drop and run. Kevin Pin, the guy's a bit close. He's got a high back lift, he's looking to hit the ball. The guy's going to sit back a bit to cut off the four instead of the one, you know. So, I mean, those are the things that we need to look at and really keep us need to be able to spot that. And that's why I'm so passionate about really keeping because we've got access to that information. You can sense the batter's body language and give the information to the bowler, you know. Um, you, you can, I mean, uh, a, a good example, uh, Pang's got John John Spence out a couple of times because John John wanted to be a Pang's, but I said, Pang's, you can't give John John pace because he comes from um, uh, the, the coast. When the ball is coming on, because it's string speed, he likes to hit through the line of the ball. So don't give him pace to mess up with his bad tempo, you know, so... And that's how we sort of worked them out. But, you know, that's the relationship that I need to have with the bowlers, you know. So that's why I said a lot in bowling meetings to understand what the bowlers are thinking. If you're saying, like, he's struggling with his back hip, in a game I can never look at that, you know. Then in a game I can say, maybe if you're on, you put a lot of balls down leg, yes, you're playing in the coast, but maybe the semi final leg a little bit finer because that's where you're going to miss. So knowledge of bowlers, knowledge of conditions, knowledge of batters and sort of what different techniques mean or skills or fundamentals as the batter sort of attempts to do it, putting all of that together to change the angle on fine leg, essentially, like that's what you're explaining, you know? <laughs> it sounds a bit complex, but, but you know, and that's the difference between, as I mentioned to you earlier, with we can keep an ascending condition, that's the difference between missing a stumbling when the ball is bouncing too high and uh, taking a stumping and saying that wicked is bouncing a bit too high. What's the best chance for me to get the stumping? It's not me standing up with the ball. It's me standing up a little bit early. It's me st- staying low for a little bit longer. Yeah, then obviously there's all of that stuff, the, the skill-based yeah. stuff that the wicket keeper has to do. You know, and, and, and that then essentially makes it sound like something that is, uh, you know, it is its own skill in its own right, and to just slap the gloves on some batter you know, might not allow a team to have the best behind the stumps. You know, you often hear people talk about, uh, he's the best wicket keeper. Well, what does that actually mean? It means more than, from our conversation, yeah, it, for me now, it means more than just somebody being able to just catch the ball well. Yeah, both, both people can catch the ball, but one brings more to the table. He can figure out, he, he can read the batter, he can work with these bowlers because he knows them. He can set angles and fields and things like that. What would you say your sort of relationship with your captains have been like? Because often we would think captains need to do this type of stuff too. You know, they also need to, you know, change yeah. angles or make sure, sure that the right people are in the right places. So how did you sort of manage that relationship? And you've played in a lot of teams. So I'm assuming a lot of captains, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think one thing that I also understood is because for the benefit of the team, uh, if we feel the I have to be on top of my game, the bowler has to be, and the captain, you know. So I cannot be sitting and saying, bowler, bowl there, if I'm not understanding what the captain is trying to do, you know. Yeah. So then again, to go back to the point when there was a management meeting or captain's meeting, I would also be invited to understand how the captain thinks. If the captain is defensive, then I will say, hey, maybe skip, but this guy's like this, maybe we can add an extra slip because... It also has to do with my personality and what kind of captain that you are, you know. Um, so I think my biggest thing is, and that's, that's what uh, I've learned as a wicket keeper, is that because obviously it's like one position, uh, and it's a specialized position, so nobody knows what it feels like in a team to drop a catch. Nobody what it feels like to be a form. Where if you get a duck, and can speak to you like you're number five. If you bowl um, a terrible over, you can speak to you like your first change ball as a wicket keeper. Generally, they acquired emotional intelligence. When you ask me the question, and I forgot to tell you, emotional intelligence with, with wiki keepers is quite important, you know? Um, and to get back to another point, I don't know if I'm like maybe losing you there, but it, with emotional intelligence is that to get the best out of Nandre Berger, I needed to be a bit hard on him. But I could not have the same approach to Biron Hendricks because Biron would never respond to that, you know? So he's from the coast. He's a bit more laid back. He just wants to like run and ball, top of ball. But with Nandre, I can say, hey, Nandre, 
you're sleeping and we need a bit more from you, you know? So emotional intelligence is quite important. Also with captains, is like, I mean, what kind of captain do I have? You know, so when I was young, I had Doug Rudolph, uh, Martin Van Asphalt, and Pierre, uh, Pierre Uvan. But I know what's actually quite brilliant in that because you will be at Gunny and say, man, fine leg is a bit too square. You move him for this reason. So the next time I knew when I was in that situation, this is why I have to move him. Okay, this guy's got hot hands. Maybe push your point and cover a little bit square, you know? So he just didn't move those guys because he was experienced. He explained that to me to have the knowledge when I get into the situation next time, I understand the reason why, you know? Mm-hmm. So same with captaining. He said, like, I need to understand, like, why is my captain making that body decision? I'll have my suggestion of if this is what I see, but he might see something different. But if I understand why I see something different, I can work around a way to get into what I see and vice versa. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. I mean, I, I, I feel like maybe the last little bit of this conversation, there's two more topics I want to just cover cover with you, right? So the, the first one would be, we'll, we'll leave the, hopefully the fun and entertaining one for last. Uh, yeah. the, the first one would be, so obviously you've, you've had to work with a lot of coaches um, over, over your time. You know, what is some of the things that coaches have done well from a wicket-keeping point of view? And what are some of the things that coaches haven't done well? The way you thought, shucks, man, this, is, this guy is busy neglecting my skill. And we don't have to name and shame or anything like that, right? I'm sure someone yeah. like Ray, he's, Ray that you've mentioned before, I'm sure he's got like a lot of... Um, uh, respect for you, and I think he was a phenomenal, phenomenal coach and, and mentor, for, especially from a wicket keeping point of view. But what would be the things? What would be the things that coaches do well and not well? Uh, I, I think, I mean, if if, if we had to um, go back a bit, uh, is that during lockdown, obviously, we got into like the phase of like video calls and Zoom meetings, you know, and there was a lot of that around. And I'm not saying that I know everything. I know a little bit about keeping. I'm still learning. And a lot of the coaches, actually, two things. Either they don't have the confidence of coaching keeping, or they don't know how to. You know, because a lot of companies that I had with him is like, what drill would you do with the guy that's trying to move down leg? You know? Uh, it'll be like, okay, my wicked keeper's struggling with this. I don't know what to do with it. So in those two situations, either the coach is not confident or he doesn't have the information. And uh, I've had like a lot of conversation with the coaches. But uh, the coach that I've worked with, and, and I obviously understand we short staff and we can't be fortunate where we have been like a lot of backroom staff. But I think also as a wicket keeper in, in some teams, um, I had to discuss with the coach and say, coach, um, I'm going to take my game. I'm going to take ownership to my game. So my last season, I said, Bongs, uh, we don't have enough manpower. I'm going to arrive 30 minutes before the game. I want to work on my routine because you're going to get busy. You know, I didn't wait for him to say, man, let's do keeping. You know, it was a conversation that I with him. It's like, yes, I'm struggling with this. Have a look at this in the game and how we can work it out. But also in the same breath, and which what I'm enjoying with coaching is that, uh, where I'm at right now would be with like some of like our young coaches. I'll be, okay, you run the session there. Have a look at this guy and make the guys think about, about cricket, you know, because sometimes we, we put so much structure and there's no free reign of thinking, you know. So like the good coaches that I've worked with, they were never scared to bring in a specialist, whether it was like batting, bowling, keeping, fielding, you know. They were like, listen, I'm struggling with this. Can I bring in someone else? You know, and the good conversation was that like I'm working with teenage kids at the school. I'm not a qualified sports psychologist, but we've got a sports psychologist who's a business teacher. I'm gonna try to rope him in and work through that line. You know? Um, yeah. and I think it's the same with like the best coach that I've worked with. The best coach that I've worked with, it wasn't about the egos, it was about how can I make the team better, how can I become better. Yeah. Um so, so you, you, um, like, how would you, how would a wicket keeping practice go for you? Like, what would a good wicket keeping sort of session look like? Um, so, 
if, if I can maybe, because obviously, uh, when I was younger, I did a lot of it because for me it was about, there wasn't specialists really keeping coaches at the time. So it was like, how many balls can I catch? If I take a one and catch, and what it felt like, I'll try to replicate that the next time I'm in that situation. If the ball was dragging and I did that, I'll try to replicate that, you know? But as I grew a bit older, obviously I had an understanding of what, what made me a decent keeper and what I need to work on. So I will say, okay, cool, last season I'll sit back and reflect. And that's also a bit more complex at a more professional level. I would sit back and, and reflect and say, okay, cool, I'm going to Durban next year. Um, who was good in Durban? Dar- Dar- Darren Smith was quite good. He was like very low in his setup. So off season, I'll work on that, you know? So if I went to, for argument's sake, uh, Joburg, I'll look at who was good there. Um, I'm forgetting his name now. He played back in the day. Messi Harris. I used to enjoy watching Messi Harris when I started playing, you know? He was like very mobile, very agile, very athletic. You know, so when I went to the one that I reflected back on like what he did very well there and I structured my training sessions around those things, you know, so that's also preparing for conditions. But in the same breath, I will focus on like what makes me good would be like I'm trying to catch in front of my hands, my hand positions, which I think it's the most important thing. I can't be having my fingers pointing towards where the ball is coming from. My palms has to face where the ball is coming from when I'm catching. Uh, reverse cup above my chest, catching sideways. If I can catch with my palms facing towards the ball, I've got a bigger catching surface. I've got a better chance if the ball turns or hits a wider neck because my catching surface is a bit bigger. So if my catching surface is a bit smaller, it means I have to catch the ball up the middle. So if you think about it, it's like almost going to net session, but with a midnight bat, <laughs> you don't have a chance there, you know? Uh, so I was structured at that, and then obviously condition was quite key, you know, because... With conditioning, I realized when do I start getting tired. So for a good example, I picked up a routine, and that obviously came with experience, is that over number uh, 79, I would have a bit more errors because I've gone on pilot mode, it's a second new ball, it might come on, on a bit quicker. So I used to make mistakes there, and over number 115, you know, because then I was like getting tired thinking about declaring. But I realized after a while, okay, this is where I'm making mistakes. I need to be a little bit more switched on then. I need to give a little bit more energy, even though we're going with the flow of the game, but that's what I need here, you know? Um, so, it's, yeah, I don't know if I'm answering your question in terms of, like, how I structure my training sessions, but it was what, like, I was going to need and who am I keeping to. If I'm keeping in Durban, a lot of spin. If I'm keeping in the high field, some spin and catching a lot of balls because Nick, Nick off and stuff like that, you know, it, it, it will be that yeah. So... For example, I chatted to one of my keepers at the school. I said, in season, we haven't had a lot of rain. We're going to pull a lot of spin. So off season, you're going to work on keeping on spin. Because that's what we're going to get on our kids at home. We're not gonna, we, never, we never know what we're going to get away. But that's what we're going to get. Yeah. The wiggle is going to turn a little bit more. That's what I'm going to work on. Okay. What, 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 would it, what would your routine be? Because that's something you've sort of mentioned a couple of times. So my, my routine, so whether I was doing like a hard session or I was doing like a pre-game routine, it would be 10 catches straight. I want to catch a ball out the middle. Same as when we do one down drills before the game, hit the ball out the middle, 10 out the hand, but I'll focus in on like slowing it down and trying to catch the ball out the middle to get a feel. Because for me, I was like a field guy. If the ball didn't hit the middle, I felt a little bit nervous here. So... I'm a, I'm a big fan of like doing reflex works and challenging the guys. So if I have a session like that or if I have a session like that, I will top up with like a feel good session. Because with uh, catch up balls and reflexes, sometimes I used to get into a bad habit because it's defensive because it's quite tough. And then I'll take that into the game. But if I've had like a tough session, I will top up with like 10 on down straight, 10 on the volley, where I'm focusing on feeling good. You know, because for me, it was a feel. If I put the ball out the middle, or I hit the ball out the middle, I was feeling good. It means I will move good. I will catch good. I'll be more confident yet. But I'll still challenge myself in between that. So for the game, I will go with um, uh, my last game I played, we played in Mbopo. So which was like, obviously, hard wicket. It was turning. It was quite dry. I went, uh, Bong's going to get 10 on the arm straight. 
I want to catch the ball out the middle, focus on my fingers pointing down. Uh, I'm going to catch 10 left, and then I'm going to catch 10, 10 left and 10 right handed. But the focus is because the wicket is slow, I'm not going to catch anything uh, chest up. You know, everything is going to be a bit low. Then I said, okay, cool, let's go on the bowling strip. We're going to work on, like, hitting the rough because that's what's going to happen on uh, day four. So I'll work on, like, getting the feel on how we keep that. Okay. But, Did you have, yeah. a, like, a... So, no, sorry, you can continue. Yeah, yeah. but in, in the same breath, even though, like, the the session was tough, maybe if the wicket was sitting too much, I will go back to what's going to get me to feel good. Hmm. Okay. Do you have like a, a routine that you used as a wicket keeper during the game? Yeah, yeah, all the same. All the same. So, yeah, so uh, when I was young, because then I gave methods and technique, we were taught like stay down for as long as you can, you stand up with the ball. I found out when I played professional cricket, I used to dive a lot because I was too low. So I never had access to the ball. You know, so if you think of it like a batsman falling over and getting ball straight, they don't have access to the ball, you know? So I figured, okay, cool, I can still do the same, but the timing is important, you know? So I understood with my shine, is going to be a bit of a delayed action. I want to start setting up two meters before he starts bowling so I can be a bit more efficient. Same with the spinners is I, was, I, I wouldn't sit low because the body is... Um, uh, because... Being in a squat position is quite tough, you know, and it's taxing. So the body wants to get comfortable. When it gets comfortable, it becomes lazy. So when you stay there for long, we become lazy, and we say, yeah, we were flat-footed. No, you were just in that position for too long, you know. So for me, it will be like, okay, I'll wait, be upright. As soon as the ball is about to jump, I'll go down, tap, and get ready, you know. Uh, so same with the spinners. I wouldn't sit on my heels for too long. If Pams was running into bowl, tap, stay long, and then stand up with the ball, you know. Um, so that's what has worked for me. Where I said sometimes when the kids ask me about, hey, but Quentin sits there for long. I'm like, Quentin is like a special human being, so we cannot compare ourselves with him. <laughs> We're a little bit limited <laughs> at the moment, you know. So, yeah. so look at someone, you know, who's good with the basics. If you look at Tim Payne, he said obviously a uh, low. Uh, um, very early, but he had a bit of a chiller to get his body to move. Same with Alex Carey. So they had a bit of a tap to get their body to move. So with the kids, like they sit there for long, the body gets comfortable, and then we become lazier. Yeah, because I found that sometimes to teach that whole more dynamic motion to younger cricketers is actually quite difficult. They, 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 they tend to struggle a little bit with that rhythm, you know, of understanding when to go down, when to tap. So I, I kind of like the idea to potentially play with. Well, what would that trigger be? Like, what what did the pain or carry do to trigger themselves? I kind of like that idea. Maybe to younger cricketers yeah. when they get a little bit older. But again, that's well, just me. Uh, but... Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you can see. I'm gonna try to set up the camera. Uh, so I'll give a bit of a demo here. So Alex carrying them. So he will go. I don't know if you can see my feet. So they will yeah. go down there. Down there, yeah. and as soon as the guy's about to bowl, they'll go tap and then set, yeah. Oh, uh, okay, you know? a little step with a foot, a little step with a, a little foot. step, yeah. So, but okay. I mean, obviously, if you, if you look at their bowling attack, like Ben Cummings, Mitchell Stark, Josh Hazelwood, they were setting up to catch the ball on the offside because their bowlers were quite good. So, with the kids, it's a bit tough because some of the kids don't have the control, you know. Um, so, with them, was when uh, Grant Morgan said the idea of just catching the ball is a good idea. And then they can just figure it out because the kids cannot bowl five minutes in a row at that age. So it becomes a bit tough, yeah. You know? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, makes sense. Okay, so, so last topic, right? Last little thing. Yeah. A bit of banter, right? You mentioned it a bit earlier. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. the best part yeah. about wicket keeping, but I'm leaving it to last because I think it, it needs the least importance from a development point of view. <laughs> you surely have some good story. You surely have some good story of some banter that happened that's that that's good to retell. <laughs> oh my goodness! Okay, uh, I, I, I don't I, I don't know if um, I could say this live, but um, you know, <laughs> we can so edit the, out the we can edit out the bad words. <laughs> the bad words, yeah. So I, I mean, um, so there was um, 
One, uh, and because our theme this week was about spinning. Uh, so we were working on playing spins. So I remember our first grand swan just after school in, in uh, East London. You know, so obviously I was like young, buzzing, and uh, I just came from SNL 19. So I had a word with like Ryan Side Bottom, Alistair Cook. I don't know what I was doing. Yeah. <laughs> so, and uh, the English guys, when the wicket fell, I was getting number seven. When I walked down the changing room, they stood next to the wicket, you know, like staring at me. You know? um, so as I'm running in, I look down, I'm a bit shy. I'm thinking, what's going on? And when I look up, they're still staring at me up until I took my guard, you know. And um, so Graham Swan bowled the first ball. He only bowled with, like, a, a slip and a mid-off. Bowled it outside of stump, first ball, play, and miss. And my prior said, Swanee, there's two things you should never do. Cut a spinner and pat a batting dog. So I was a batting dog because I was, like, too loud on the field. <laughs> Yeah, and I only lasted like three balls after that. Yeah. <laughs> See, so, 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 so I think this is what I wanted to get to, right? Like that, that sounds like good, clean, in the game type stuff, right? Maybe, I don't know if it was said as cleanly as that, but it sounds like good, clean, in the game banter, right? And maybe a good chirp, throw you off your game, make you feel like a bit of a, a newbie. You know, and, and, and it has its effect, right? Obviously, you brash, you have your words to these legends of the game or these big names. You say, well, I'm going to come at you. Yeah. And they gave you one back. What's your take on, you know, wicked keepers and banter? Is it, is it better for them to be quiet and not say much? Because bowlers normally get told, let the ball do the talking. But the wicked keeper doesn't have a ball. And the wicked keeper is right there. But at the same point in time, my perception is that there's a fine line that we don't really want to cross, mm. you know? And so, uh, What's your, what's your sense about yeah. that? Uh, and, and, and I mean, I, I love it. I mean, we, we've got a kid uh, at under 12. He's like one of the best squash players in the country. He's a phenomenal keeper. You know, so at under 12 at our school, there's only one under 13. There's one at 12 cricket team. So when he's 12, he had to play under 30. You know, and he's got like good chirps, you know. So the first time I met him, before I even knew he was a wicked keeper, I was at Fizz Ed. He was about to bowl. So I was like setting up the cones. So he says to his mate, um, Logan, uh, do you have bad tape? You know, so I'm like, okay, I want to hear what this is going. He's like, because your stumps are going to need it, yeah. You know, so like, that is like good banter, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I, mean, yeah. You know, so I, mean, I mean, the other day he told me, he's like, you've got to stump him because uh, he told the band, he's like, hey, best man, I can see your toes bleeding. The oak ran down the weekend, got up. So there, there is, so banter is not abuse because there's a fine line. You know, so abuse, it'll be like, I'm just calling guys' names. And, you know, so for me, banter was if somebody never chirped me, also I'll chirp someone within the fans, but I will create a bit of theater around it where I will run to the stumps all the time to create a bit of, like, discomfort there. I wasn't abusing the guy, but I'll create a bit of discomfort. I'm like, for the next five overs, I'm going to run up to the stumps, you throw the ball back to me to make him feel a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah. And then now and then I'll have a word of, like, hey, uh, you haven't scored runs in the last two games. Are you getting dropped the next game? You know? Mm -hmm. So there's a difference between banter and abuse. You know, and generally, like, banter with wicked keepers is really about the jokes, just to get the guy distracted of his game. You mm -hmm. know? So, I mean, the, 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 the one thing that I, I would also do, it would be with, with the empires. Yeah. You know? So, and I think keepers were so smart. You know, whatever. So, b before I get into that, is, when I stood up to the wickets for Seema, my biggest goal was to get the bails as quickly as possible as I could to make the batsmen feel nervous here. You know, so then they become a bit more tentative than I know, you know? Um, so I, I, I was, obviously I've had a bit of like bad words with some players in the field, but I'm not a massive fan for that, you know? So again, to go back to our, uh, our conversation, I was a bit more guy that spoke quite a bit when I played with Grant Rulofsen. Grant Rulofsen had his presence with his body language. He was never a guy that like spoke a bit, but his body presence and his body language spoke for him. You know, where for me, I need to speak to get myself to be upbeat. Yeah. Okay. Awesome, Mangi. This has been fun. I've, I've thoroughly yeah. enjoyed this. I hope I hope you got some value out of sort of spending the no. last hour with me chatting wicked keeping. <laughs> 
No, I, I, I love it, yeah. I love it. I never thought I would, but like, I love it, yeah. I mean, I've had four or five conversations the last week about really keeping my bad conversations with the guys. And I said when I went to my level three is I didn't go there saying that I know everything. I wanted to listen to Priya. I wanted to listen to Jolene. Uh, because once we start becoming, and once we start thinking with our egos, then we're not learning anything. I wanted to learn as much as I can, you know, and I mean, listening to you the other day is, I love like performance training. I love like emotionally, I love like those kind of things, you know, so, and I feel we've started doing it in a mild way, but I've seen the impact that has had with the kids that I coach, you know? Brilliant. I mean, 50% of our kids from the junior schools to the high school are only in the top 10, you know, in academics. Yeah. yeah. And the drive Brilliant. was in like, yeah, you know, so like, I love this. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. So thank, thank you very much for that. Jay. Brilliant. Uh, I, I appreciate your time and I appreciate you sharing so, so freely about the things that you know. I've definitely learned some stuff from this conversation. Wicked Keeping is not a strength of mine and there's certainly one or two things I can take from this uh, moving forward. Thank you very much. No, it's a pleasure, Jules. Anytime, if you want to share ideas, please do let me know. Cool. Perfect. Thanks. All right. All right. All right. Cheers. Bye-bye.